Okay, so it's um, it's nine o'clock. We should get started. So uh, welcome everyone to the Science and Society Parallel Session. So we have six talks um, to come. So let's get straight to it. We'll start with uh, Rukmani Mohanta. Um, so you have 15 minutes plus five minutes for questions, Rohanti. Sorry, sorry, Rukmani. Okay, thank start you. Start whenever you're ready. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Rukmani Mohanta from University of Hyderabad, India. Before I start, let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'm going to talk about a rather challenging issue towards gender equality in high energy physics. The outline of my presentation goes as follows. First, I will give a brief introduction to problems related to gender parity in science. Then I will talk about various initiatives taken at different levels to reduce this gender gap in India. What are the available opportunities for girls and women in India? And then finally, I will conclude. Uh, there is no doubt that women are integral part of the society and contribute equally to the development of nation. Therefore, the scientific endeavors cannot be reached without their full potential. However, there is no dispute that women are underrepresented in science or more generally in STEM careers. So scientific intelligence is not linked to a specific gender, a metaphor which is frequently used is the leaky pipeline concept, carrying students from higher secondary school through university and subsequently jobs in STEM. This pipeline leaks students at various stages. One interesting feature of this leak, these leaks is that women leak more out than men do. The effect of this differential leaking removes one gender from the stream and leaves the other to arrive at the end of the pipeline. That is further we go along the pipeline, only few, fewer women we find. This results the gender imbalance that is observed today, which is a global issue now. So at the lower level, um, that women are, uh, at the low, uh, lower level, women representation more or less even, however, when we go up in the ladder, they become more scarce. This hierarchical discrimination leading to glass ceiling effect. For example, in India, uh, Department of Science and Technology has initiated the INSPIRE program, that is Innovation in Science Pursuit for Inspired Research in 2008 for nurturing and attracting young talents for its career in science. If we look into the um, data of INSPIRE Fellowship holders, or gold medalists at different uni universities at master's level, we can see that around 50% of them are women. So what has happened to these talented women? Why we do not see the same percentage in the higher levels? Though the numbers have improved over the past one decade or so, there is still a long way to go before women are equally represented. Diversity, equality, and inclusion is a high priority for each of us as individuals. So these are some data uh, on the women faculty representation in various institutes, leading institutes in India. The numbers given in black, they are for the research institutes like the IFR, IISC, Physical Research Laboratory, Institute of Physics, SRI, and so on. And the numbers given in red, these are for IITs, which are premier technological institutes in India. And the numbers in blue, they correspond to the leading universities in India. If we pay our attention to the percentage of women in these institutes, we can see that roughly they represent 10 to 15 percent for the women. And when we when it comes to our fellowship, fellowships of various national scientific academies and lead, leadership positions, these numbers drastically reduced. This is another data uh, where, which gives the women physics professors in India, the blue bars represent the men and the pink, they represent the women. And it is disheartening to see that almost in all institutes, the number of female faculty members in physics are less than five. So possible reasons um, for 
uh, for this under representation of women. This could be due to the implicit or explicit bias in which the full participation of women in science, the biological differences between men and women, the absence of female scientists as role models, family pressure and social obligations. So to mitigate the gender gap, proactive, proactive measures are required from all uh, sections of the society, from individual level to institutional level, policy and decision makers and government sector. It is the responsibility for all of us to contribute whatever possible way that we can do. So these are some of the initiatives from the government side in India. So government of India has been very proactive in this issue and already introduced several programs for all levels. Recently in 2020, the Department of Science and Technology has launched a pilot program, Gender Advancement for Transforming Institutions, GATI. It aims to nudge institutions for higher education and research towards supporting diversity, inclusion of all spectrum of talent and success and pro progression. GATI draws its inspiration from the Athena Swan Gender Equity Charter and Accreditation Framework operated by Advanced HE UK. So in this program, all the institutes of national importance and other autonomous science and technology institutions are invited to participate. The pilot institution, initially 25, would commit to adopt gender parity principles with their policies, practices, action plans, and institutional culture. These are some of the career opportunities for girl students in India. The Begin Jyoti program, which was launched again by Department of Science and Technology in 2019 to inspire girl students to pursue higher education and career in STEM fields. It provides a scholarship visit to nearby scientific institutions, science camps, lectures by lectures from eminent women scientists and career counseling. Another program, which is a advanced program offered by TIFR known as Bigyan Bidusi. This is for women students who are in their final year of MSc, first year of MSc. It provides them an exposure to advanced physics topics and research opportunities and encourage them to take up research in physics as a career option. The students, they get the opportunity to be taught, inspired and mentored by successful women scientists. The Department of Science and Technology also supports empowering women scientists. And the program Kiran program, which is basically knowledge involvement in research advancement through nurturing. It, um, in this scheme, the mandate is to bring gender parity in science and technology through gender mainstreaming. There are various programs under Kiran. One is the Women Scientist Scheme, in which it provides opportunities for women scientists who have break in their career. It provides them a good amount of research grant, which includes fellowship, uh, minor equipment, travel contingency, and so on. Another plan is the SERB Power Research Grant. In this scheme, it aims to encourage emerging and eminent women researchers in frontier areas of science and engineering. The Indian Physics Association also has taken various initiatives. It launched the working group, which is known as Gender in Physics Working Group in 2017, with the mandate of evaluating and mitigating the large gender gap in physics pro profession and coordinating national efforts towards gender parity in physics. The objectives are to facilitate deliberation on the issue of gender parity, come up with recommendations from time to time to address the issue, network with IUPAP and corresponding working groups of IPS international sister organizations. It organized the first ever gender in physics conference, Pressing for Progress at University of Hyderabad in September 2019. And there are around 250 to 300 participants. And the outcome of this conference is known as the Hyderabad Charter for Gender Equity in Physics. It's a guiding document towards gender equity in physics and the detailed report can be found in this link. So some of the recommendations are work-life balance policies such as child care leave, mobility schemes should be gender neutral. Uh, criteria for hiring should be formulated beforehand and no hidden norms or criteria should be used. Status, position, background of life partners should not be criteria in hiring. 
policies that facilitate spousal hiring employment in the neighborhood and or transport should be formulated. And there should also be mentoring mechanisms for young faculty must be made available within the institutions. Uh, mandatory gender audit of staff at all levels should be published on the organizational website. Uh, in high energy physics also, there are few initiatives for improving the gender gap. In the national level high energy physics symposium in 2020, a special session was dedicated to deliver the issue related to gender gap in physics, high energy physics. This, is, this has set the precedent for gender diverse, diversity discussion at future meetings. The gender group in high energy physics has been Mm, formed in December 2020, and I am the chair of that working group. The group is in the process of organizing a career guidance workshop for young women physicists, most probably during April 2022. Uh, and we know that female role models, they have had a profound impact on young women's achievement and inspirations, in part because they represent the possibility of how overcoming gender barriers to achieve success. In this context, a special article in Physics News has been published, remembering Dr. Viva Chaudhary, who is the first, who was the first woman particle physicist in India. So I will give a very brief glimpse uh, of uh, her scientific career. So she was the first woman particle physicist in India and made significant contribution in the study of cosmic rays and discovery of mesons using photographic plates. So she did her master's at Calcutta University during pre-independence era. And after her MSc, she worked with the legendary cosmic ray physicist, Professor D.M. Bose for four years, 1938 to 1942. And she published four papers in Nature. In fact, Powell used the same technique to detect pions and muons and won the Nobel Prize in Physics. She obtained her PhD from University of Manchester under the supervision of Nobel laureate, Professor Blackett. After that, she returned back to India and worked in two research institutes, TIFR and PRL. But sadly, she remained practically unknown to the scientific community of India. She came to limelight in 2019 when she was honored by the International Astronomical Union, who named a white yellow dwarf star after her, which is located 340 light years from Earth in the Sextans constellation. So to conclude, people of all genders have equal potential to excel and utilization of the talents of all is absolutely essential. Time alone will not achieve the gender equality and conscious effort is must. Mitigating the gender gap at all levels of physics practice is a necessary step to achieve equality. And the commitment of institutional leaders is key to make this progress. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rukmani, for this really nice talk on a very important topic. <clears throat> so uh, we have time for some questions now. Um, feel free to raise your hands if you want to ask a question or even write something out in the chat. I see uh, Johan, you have a question, go ahead. Hi, yes, uh, thanks for such a great um, talk. I, I think what you're mentioning is is, is incredibly important. I'm glad that it's, it seems that in the recent years, there's been a lot of movement. Um, so I wanted to ask about uh, the culture of uh, including gender nonconforming folks or transgender folks into these kinds of programs. Uh, is this something that is uh, possible via the, you know, the, the, the various laws and such that exist in India? Um, I, I'm mentioning this because my own country of Costa Rica, um, that's not something that's possible, although it's something that people want to do. So there's a lot of roadblocks that are uh, fiscal or legal or whatnot. So, so I wanted to ask uh, what the status of that is uh, in these kinds of programs. So basically, still now there is no nothing as such formulated, but the various gender groups, they are trying to implement something so that probably in a decade or so, there should be some... Um, Mm, like you know, they should include the women or the women representation should be high in those programs. Uh, 
perhaps I can ask a question um, while others are formulating theirs. Um, so you talked about the fact that there might have been some time evolution in the last decade that things looked like they were improving. Yeah. Um, are you keeping track of, of the time dependent statistics on representation? Uh, and, and seeing not how, really. In particular, how yeah. different programs might be um, might be influenced. Yes, yes. So 10, uh, 10 years back, now the faculty representation is um, more or less 10 to 15 percent or some in some institution it is up to say 20 percent but 10 years back it was like less than 10 percent in most most of the institutes and also if we see into the number of female phd students in physics the numbers uh, number has improved uh, drastically in, in the last 10 years or so um, around 40 percent women phd students uh, are there in physics Well, that's that's a that's a, a good high number. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Thanks. That's good to hear. I see we have a question from Marco. Yeah. Th thanks very much for the uh, very nice talk and, and and great to see this this connection to Manchester uh, in, in in your talk. Uh, my my question actually goes in that direction. Uh, is there something concrete we can do, or or, or uh, what what what's the best uh, way we 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 can help the uh, in 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 this uh, direction from from an international perspective? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, we give jobs uh, uh, to people and 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 uh, um, have Indian students at our institutes uh, doing their PhDs and other studies. Um, but but is there is there one specific area where 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 you would say that that could really help uh, if if uh, international uh, institutes were to do that? Yeah. So I will discuss with the group members and I will get back to you. So this is very nice nice uh, offer from your side. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? It doesn't look like it. So um, thank you again, uh, Rukmani, for your really nice talk. Uh, okay, thank you so much. To the next contribution. So um, our next speaker is, is Hannah Wakeling, and she'll be talking to us about diversity and inclusion at Bell 2. So Hannah, I see you. You try sharing your slides. And can you see my title? Yeah, I mean, we can hear you clearly. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, my name is Hannah Wakeling. Actually, uh, Anna, the yeah. sound is a little bit muted. Are you able to move close to the microphone or perhaps adjust your settings? Sure. Slightly? All right. Let me just adjust my audio. Um, how's that? A bit more. I think it, it's probably fine. People can adjust their volumes accordingly. So thanks. Um, I see okay. you've started screen sharing, but I don't see anything yet. Um, does that work? OK, let me try uh, a different setup. <clears throat> mm. Yep, that looks good. Okay. So Is please go right? ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. So hello, my name is Hannah Wakeling. She, her, they, them pronouns. And I'm very happy to be here today to present Bell 2's diversity and inclusion activities. So thank you to the uh, organizers for this opportunity. Um, I, won't have I won't have time to explain everything in 15 minutes. So please do feel free to send me an email. Um, Today, I will be introducing our collaboration and um, our presenting statistics taken from our membership registrations in our 2018 survey. I will discuss actions that Bell2 and KEK have been taking to promote diversity and inclusion within the collaboration, and I'll show some initiatives and goals that we hope to implement in the future. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that my university, McGill, is situated on unceded Kenyan Kahaka traditional territory. This means that this land was taken, not paid for, or given by the Kenyan Kahaka people. Through this acknowledgement, I hope to respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I work and live in today. 
So the Belter experiment is known as a B factory and detects the products of electron positron collect, uh, collisions at the Upsilon Forest Resonance and is hosted at the KK High Energy Research Organization with Scuba in Japan. We have over 1,000 members in four different continents. And uh, so we have many people from many cultures coming together to work on high energy, lum uh, sorry, high luminosity physics. So now I've given a very short introduction. In this next session, I will dive into collaboration demographics. So as you may know, the gender gap in physics is disappointingly one of the highest in science. The gender gap of Bell 2 is sadly on par with the rest of the physics. And here I present the gender of collaborators by year from 2011 to 2021. In addition, we've included a gender parity subplot showing the percentage of women at the Bell 2, at Bell 2 in relation to the, the, this dashed 50% line um, you can see on the plot. So our collaboration uh, has, in size has doubled for, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, from 2011 to 2021, we have seen an increase of approximately 12.2% uh, to 17.9%, uh, which is statistically significant. In 10 years, we have uh, increased the proportion of women by 68%. However, the percentage of women within the collaboration is still only increasing slightly each year. If we use the average uh, from these two numbers, we increase our percentage of women approximately 0.57% each year. At this rate, L2 would reach parity in uh, 2078. 56 years is beyond the predicted lifetime of uh, our experiment. Currently, the world average of physicists um, that are women hovers around 20%. So Bell 2 is well on the way to meeting that value. Here, <clears throat> here I'd like to acknowledge the issues often perpetuated in the form of data taking with respect to a gender binary. Um, Bell, 2, Bell 2's current membership form allows um, in the form to find other and unspecified and to uh, keep anonymity and to avoid outing someone's gender against their will. Finally, I'd like to note that in our collaboration, we encourage everyone to use colorblind friendly uh, color schemes in their plots. So the for the rest of the plots in this talk, this is implemented and a big thanks to Jeanette de Lamotte for those for these. <coughs> Next, we have the gender of collaborators by region. Here we have grouped the data by the selected regions to again ensure anonymity. Uh, another reason we have used these categorizations is to be able to compare to a similar plot that's by Atlas. Um, and as, Jala, as, as Japan alone contributes to 16% of the people in the collaboration, we've also separated Japan from the Asia region uh, for a clearer presentation of the plot. So the regions defined are Japan, Asia, excluding Japan, Eastern Europe, the Mediterranean, Northern America, Northern Europe, and the Southern Hemisphere. One takeaway from this plot is the comparison, comparison between two regions or countries with similar representation within collaboration. So comparing Japan, which rep represents 16% of the collaboration to Northern America, which represents 17% uh, of the collaboration, you can see that Japan has a higher representation of women uh, than Northern America. So 17% compared to 9% uh, respectively. <coughs> Next, we have the gender of collaborators by position. The percentage of women drops as their career progresses from the uh, postgraduate to permanent faculty. This effect is largely influenced by the consequences of age, where permanent faculty did their PhDs in a time where the percentage of women in physics at the university student level hovered around the 5 to 10 percent mark, rather than the 20 percent mark now. However, we're still not entirely exempt from the coined and problematically termed EV pipeline effect, um, where there's still a drop in gender representation at the permanent faculty level. The largest drop in gender representation is between high school and university. So therefore we can work on encouraging women into undergrad and postgrad physics um, programs and make sure the environment is healthy for them there. Um, these are the ones who will propagate up to the higher levels where women are vastly underrepresented. Um, with more emphasis being put on diversity and inclusion in the recent years and more efforts being made, uh, we should expect to see a vast improvement within the next decade. The final shot, uh, plot <coughs> I'll be showing from registration data is the percentage of women's uh, recognized involvement in the collaboration by year. This data is from 2020. The orange line displays the percentage of all members and these green and red lines display the percentage of women in various levels of leadership roles within the collaboration. Um, we also have this blue line, which is the percentage of collaboration talks labeled as delivered talk external. Um, and the yellow line displaying the fraction of plenary talks at Bell 2 collaboration meetings given by women marked as uh, delivered plenary internal. Given that these internal talks are often given by group chairs and the percentage of these that are female, especially in the early years of the collaboration is low, 
uh, these distri distributions are not surprising. Um, this, plus, this plot does show overall there's an upwards trend, um, but shows, shows also the need for efforts to be made to reach proportional gender representation at our, our collaboration in the near future. So moving on from our um, data, we um, Bell 2 implemented a code of conduct back in 2017. This enshrines the principles related to research practice and also fostering a, di a diverse and um, inclusive collaboration and can be found in full on our website at the bottom, right at the bottom left here. Um, two diversity officers are appointed at Bell 2 to provide a safe and con confidential point of conduct and they reiterate the code of conduct at, at our triannual collaboration meetings um, at our diversity plenary and at our diversity meetings. The, device, they, the, the diversity officers conducted a membership survey in 2018. Um, this survey is a climate survey asking for qualitative and quantitative data from our members and was inspired by a survey done by LHCB. It took approximately six months to get about 240 responses from the collaboration, which was less than 25% of our members at the time. So this data before even considering the phrasing of our questions is implicitly biased. However, considering the qualitative data collected, it is a useful uh, insight into our collaboration. Um, of our members, students were particularly elusive when trying to get them to respond. Um, and reasons for this could include lack of motivation to, or even the fact that the survey was quite long, um, worry of identifiability, or reluctance or inability to give information uh, via Google Forms. Finally, though, we um, closed the survey and these were our population representations, which if taken with a pinch of salt is quite similar to our collaboration registration data. Um, an example insight we've gained from the membership survey um, is one of those, uh, is, is of those who have withdrawn from consideration for a leadership role at Bell 2 because of the impact it would have on family life. Over 25% of those who answered indicated that they withdrew themselves from consideration. Bell 2 must now look to themselves and to our work culture to understand the cause, causes of this proportion of yeses and to see if there are actions that can be taken to mitigate them. Bell 2 is uh, also active on social media, on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We use these platforms to raise awareness of diversity and inclusion events such as the International Women's Day, LGBTQ plus STEM Day um, and Colorblind Awareness Day, for example. Um, on the right here, you can see some examples of posts we've made, which have gotten a lot of engagement. And these posts are posted in both Japanese and English. If you wish, you can follow us on these platforms using the uh, handle at Bell2Colab. And if interested, there's, a, uh, there's even a KEK Physics YouTube channel, which is, has a mixture of Japanese and English videos. <clears throat> so Bell2 has also been working on making our language inclusive. Uh, in general, we wish to avoid anything that might cause distress or feelings of ex exclusion to our uh, collaborators. In particular, we're considering words used with severe racial overtones. Our computing and software groups have taken steps to remove, our, remove or phase out the, word of, the use of the word slave from our code. Um, this has not been straightforward due to external software use, but we've been able to remove it from our uh, build machines for new operating systems from EO8 onwards. Um, so we are phasing it out. We're also phasing out the webmaster. I'd like to point out that, um, that uh, Git repositories are now very simple to fix for yourself. Uh, through simple search, you can find instructions and make your own repositories uh, more inclusive. We're also, we were also recently made aware of a translation issue with the word blinding, which um, is one, not very inclusive language, but two, the Japanese translation of this is actually quite offensive. <clears throat> uh, these are just some words that were problematic, but there are many more words used in code and physics that can be made more inclusive. Uh, for example, changing the use of uh, blacklist and whitelist simply to deny list and allow list. Uh, next on to the ever-present pandemic, Bell 2 had to rapidly change everything uh, all of our uh, data production plans due to COVID-19. Um, even with everything, we were still able to continue collecting data and actually broke the world's ins instantaneous uh, luminosity record thanks to the hard work of the local and remote shifters. Uh, this year also, we broke the integrated luminosity collected in one week record. Um, however, th this strain on our collaborators really needs to be acknowledged. Our shifters had to manage with one local shifter and one remote shifter and then an accelerator liaison and a safety shifter, which is a largely reduced team. Um, only the people based at KEK were allowed to do local shifts, so extra burden was put on these. Uh, members had to do a much higher number of shifts than expected, and this was particularly difficult for people with dependents, such as family in, in Scuba. Um, 
Even people scheduled to be at KK for part of or all of the run had to decide last minute whether to stay at KK or return to their institutes or home countries. And there was definitely socialized isolation felt by people stuck at the lab. Uh, they, they were often many time zones away from friends and family. Um, Bell2 did try to alleviate some of the stress in the form of ready meals and snacks to show appreciation for the shifters and to also increase safety and reduce stress by mitigating the need to go to supermarkets during the pandemic, uh, during the height of it. <clears throat> uh, we also held some remote social events for people at the end of run, uh, for example, an end of run party on Zoom uh, to celebrate our work and to boost morale. Um, the Bell2 collaboration meetings are currently held remotely. The only time this happened happened uh, before the pandemic was in 2011 after the Great Eastern Japan earthquake. As with many multi-continental co collaborations, meeting can, meetings can often fall at unsociable hours and may be more of a burden for those with dependents. Uh, Bell2 recorded our plenaries and certain meetings, and some sessions were split into two to allow presenters to choose a friendlier time slot. But even with these considerations, the issues that follow with online presenting cannot be fully ameliorated. Um, <clears throat> finally, I shall talk about the initiatives at the KK Laboratory, in which KK is very receptive and dedicated to any issues that come to light. For instance, Bell2, the Bell2 Secretariat worked to make childcare easier to find, as it has been historically difficult to find in Japan. Um, KSK is working on improving bathroom accessibility, and in particular, the, rep the, the, the request for a gender neutral and accessible bathroom by our experiment control room uh, that was delayed by the pandemic has been completed in last year, so that's good news. Um, Bell2, ex Bell2 members help to proofread Japanese to English translations, as often translations or cultural connota connotations evolve quicker than the KEK document for revisions, um, and there may be archaic or outdated terms used. Um, Bell2 has also asked for external food providers for more inclusive uh, food options for dietary restrictions and requirements, though there is pushback here as um, these meals generally do not sell as well in Japan. And finally, we have implemented uh, colorblind friendly screens in our control room system. Um, and here is the GUI shown with the example colorblindness filters. <coughs> For our initiatives and goals, we'd like to con continue raising awareness within the collaboration through more social posts, emails, normalizing making things accessible, such as always encouraging colorblind friendly plots. Um, we'd like to raise awareness of unconscious biases, um, which, we, which uh, maybe we can provide links to training or courses on identifying these biases. Um, we'd like to be more visible within the collaboration. So we aim to have diversity topics mentioned at the beginning of meetings and workshops. And finally, we'd like to encourage COVID-19 and video conferencing best practices, i.e. recommending camera on, at least while talking, uh, for facial cues. As we all now know, there is such a thing as Zoom fatigue, but particularly for those with, uh, for example, dyslexia, autism, and ADHD, uh, video conferencing is especially difficult uh, without facial cues. Um, and we'd also like to encourage and normalize putting self-care first. So in summary, uh, Bell2 is trying to make the collaboration more inclusive and a diverse place to work. And by anal analyzing demographics and making and taking more member surveys and working on making our environment an inclusive and safe place, we hope to do so. But we would uh, like to not only do this, we'd like to work together with the wider physics community to better the field of physics as a whole. Uh, we'd love to hear your suggestions and to share ideas. And there's still a lot for all of us to do. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Hannah, for this um, really interesting talk. You covered a lot of different topics. Um, so I see we already have a couple of hands raised. Uh, I'll start with Pippa. Thanks, that was a really interesting talk. Oh, let me, my camera was obscured. Um, I, had, I have two questions, uh, actually. One, I was very interested that you raised the use of uh, colorblind friendly colors. And I'd, I'd sort of like to link that to there's been a trend in at least some countries that, you know, to sell toys wrapped in blue for boys and pink for girls. And I've heard the suggestion that if you're making um, plots showing gender distributions, you should very much avoid using blue for boy and pink for girl. Because you're pro pro that bias that might be there. Uh, so I, I don't know if you want to comment on that. And then my second question is going to be about um, the impact of different languages on being able to use gender neutral language or trans inclusive language, uh, especially for Bell 2, where you've got um, presumably a very strong Japanese language element. So it's the color, color use and then language. 
Right, yes. So we, we did think about this when we made these plots. Um, however, we did need to um, use, when, when, when creating these plots, we did need to use um, either, I think it was blue and maybe a dark green. Um, uh, and we went with blue mainly because Bell 2's logo is blue. That was <laughs> the, um, the, the yeah, thought behind before, that. Uh, but yes. Uh, avoiding the blue plus pink was, was more the... I don't, so, yeah. It's um, fine that you've got blue since you've then got yellow and orange. Right. So, but yes, it is, it is important to um, try to uh, avoid that, that um, color bias, I guess, uh, with, with gender representation. Um, so could you repeat your second question? Yes, it was about, um, the, we talk a lot about using gender neutral uh, language, inclusive language, but largely in English. And I was wondering if you had thoughts on how difficult or that, that is when you've got, a, for example, a strong Japanese language element in the collaboration. Are there different challenges? I know certainly at CERN, uh, the French language is quite difficult to, to speak in a gender neutral way because it's so embedded. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, the, uh, the the official language that we all collaborate in at, Bel at Bel 2 is English, so um, it has been easy in that, that sense. Um, in terms of um, the gender in the Japanese language, I'm not actually too aware of that, um, but I could definitely look into it um, and, and get back to you offline. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip the order in which the questions are asked and I'll go straight to Jean Wilson. Hopefully I've pronounced your name right. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was just a quick question about um, how the leadership roles are assigned within the collaboration, I guess, because that's something you have control over, right? And like who, who takes up the leadership positions is the, I mean, have you looked at that process? Because I know this is different for every collaboration, and I guess it's <coughs> biases could creep in. Um, so at the moment, I believe the process is that um, people nominate themselves or are nominated by others, uh, and then a committee um, chooses who that is. Uh, I believe that's what um, happens. Um, so def yes, definitely, this is something that we should and are looking into. Um, we're still a very young collaboration and we're still figuring all this out, um, but this is very much a, um, a, a thing on our to-do list. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to Johan. Hi. Um, I think it's on your slide eight or nine in which you were mentioning some of the reasons, uh, say students didn't respond to this survey. Um, the thing that came to mind, at least for me, because it's happened to me, uh, is maybe it's your slide nine. Um, is, is there a membership requirement uh, in Bell 2? In say my experiment, there is, and it's quite strict. And that might lead to folks feeling like they're part of the experiment or not. So they might fill out the survey or not. And this kind of stuff affects underrepresented minorities more than it does say uh, cisgender straight white men. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if uh, there's any way to, I mean, it's hard to take a measure of that, right? But, but I just wanted to know a little bit more about the membership and how this might affect uh, a person's you know, willingness to fill out a survey because they feel part of the community or not. Right, yes. So um, for Bell 2, it, I think it is compulsory to have, to, to be a, a member um, just for all of the um, online logins, all of the uh, access to computers. That's so this very much could be um, an influence in the membership survey, which was completely um, optional. Um, um, yeah, I, I can't really say much more on that, but I agree it could be definitely a, a factor uh, to influence uh, whether people uh, want to fill it out. <coughs> so we're, we're getting close to the, the end of the allocated time. Um, Marco, do you mind if I go to someone else for the final question is yours a pressing matter following my instructions to the letter please do. Yeah. um so there's a question from nikolaus 
Yes, so thank you for this uh, nice talk. I mean, it, it's more uh, of a comment. I'm very happy that the issue of color blindness is uh, brought up because uh, I think that people are not aware that there is such a thing. And, uh, I, you know, as in most things that you, you have in this talk, uh, if people are not aware that this thing exists, you cannot uh, ad address it. And I have seen, to, to my experience, uh, several um, you know, several cases, including I'm, I'm partially colon blind myself, and I have been told off in uh, Atlas about something that oh, was of no importance, essentially. Uh, but if people were, you know, aware that there is this thing, and uh, maybe some people, they cannot see, and this actually you do it very well because you, you bring it as an issue, it improves things uh, a lot. So uh, thank you very much for, for, uh, for doing that. I hope we can make it make everyone aware of uh, the issues that follow it. Okay, great. So thanks again, Hannah. Thanks to all the people that ask questions. This is um, obviously a lot Thank of you. really interesting things that, that need um, ongoing discussion. And I hope that happens behind the scenes as well. Um, so we can move on to our next speaker now. That's uh, Tracy Berry. So I see Tracy's connected. Um, and Okay, hi, can you see my slides? Yes, we see our slides. Okay, so Tracy's going to talk to us about the IOP project. Juno, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks very much for the invitation and the really interesting talks beforehand. Um, okay, yeah, I'm going to give an overview of uh, IOP project Juno and a bit of a reflection on how far it's become um, over the decade. And so looking at equality and diversity work uh, within the UK, and mainly focusing in this talk on gender equality. Okay, so to introduce those people who don't know, so what is the IOP project Juno? You know? So I'll introduce what it is, where it's relevant to apply to, why we want to have a project Juno, you know, um, how it deals with things or how it goes ahead of things, what it is in more detail, and I'll go through the six principles that are embedded in this um, project Juno, you know, and then in practice, what can universities actually do to implement good practice, and a reflection and outlook on how far we've come and a look to what we can do next. So in the physicist version, kind of it got a sort of an abstract of this in the overview, and then the introduction to what Project Junior is, the methods that we can apply, and some results, and then conclusion outlook. Okay, so Project Juno is the IOP, so that's the Institute of Physics, so the UK uh, physics body, uh, flagship gender equality award. And it originally started to look to basically just gender equality and mainly in female male gender split. So in real development and more sort of having more different um, non-binary um, sort of demographics. Um, so where it's for, so that's what it is, it's mainly started with gender equality. And where it's for, it's applied initially generally to university physics departments and schools. And it's actually developed a bit more to be related organisations as well. So, for example, the NPL, the National Physics Laboratory, is also part of Project Juno now. So why do we need this? Well, um, way back in 2010, this is a snapshot of the women in physics. So starting here, this is the percentage of female at every sort of the different levels. So starting from undergraduate physics, about 21 percent. Postgraduates, about 27 percent. All staff in physics departments, about 14 or 15 percent. And the important thing is you can see the real, the tail drop off here. Uh, so lecturers were down, down to 20%. And you can see a big drop off to senior lecturers and professors down at about 5%. So starting from, from 21, we got down to 5% uh, female professors. So how was Juno originally created? Well, it was undertook by a study of university physics departments all over the UK between 2003 and five. And they wanted to look at why this, um, this plot looked like this. So what were the issues staff might be facing and how they could help? And from the surveys they found was a lack of recruitment, retention and progression of women. And so hence Project Juno was recruited. And there's a nice video here um, if you want to look at more how to get a Juno champion project um, and how to sort of address these issues. It's on the IOP webpage. So what it does is basically it sets out a framework that uni different universities or national institutes can follow that's try to address these different principles. So it's originally started with five principles um, and then it's recently developed into a sixth principle. So it's now got an additional sixth one, which is professional conduct, harassment and bullying. So what happens is so there's these six principles. And as I'll show in a minute, there's, uh, there's three different levels. 
and you sign up and to address these different principles. So the principles are first having an organizational framework because you need some sort of structure that you can actually do anything with. Um, then it looks at the different um, stages of a, a career. So looking at appointment and selection. So there's the bias at the start, so letting people in. Then it looks at um, the career progression and promotion to see why the drop off occurs. And it looks at it, um, trying to improve working culture and workload allocation, because it's going to affect how people focus their time and what positions and leadership positions they're given. And it looks about the flexible working, because we've heard from previous talks, um, having children and other caring responsibilities can impact on people's careers. And then finally, of course, it addressed it is now got its influence the like principle on professional conduct, harassment, and bullying. So there's several levels of this award. There's three levels, but like bronze, silver, and gold. But these in this um, pro 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 project, they're called supporter, practitioner, and champion. So to start off with, sorry, flip those IDs, but they start off with you start off with supporter. So you start off by supporting the principles. So your college signs up or university signs up to say they're going to try to embed these good principles and good practices throughout their department. Then once you can demonstrate you've embedded, so basically principle one, which is good practice, a good organizational structure and framework. You've allocated some leadership positions and some money and time for people to um, address this. Then you apply for a practitioner status because you're and you should be monitoring your data and qualitative and quantitative data and be practicing um, the, the embedded data collection principles. So you can then start to see where your um, institution lies within these different this framework. And then once you to get the practitioner, you then have to also be practicing the good practice and looking at your data and monitoring statistics and trying to address any issues you do find if you look at your data for your different students and staff populations. And you have to make then an action plan that try to get you towards being a, a champion. Um, a champion. Now these are three or three to five year action plans, so it's not something you can get overnight. Each of these levels typically takes sort of three to five years to to work towards to embed good practice and go through a whole annual cycle of seeing if you can make good practice to in, improve environment for for all in your department. And then finally, uh, you get to champion status when you can show and prove to a, an external assessment panel that you are at the champion level. And so I've, uh, I've personally, my experience is that I was the Juno champion for our physics department. And so got us through all these different levels for our department. And I've also been on the national assessment panel. So assessed every university involved in this sort of for six years. Um, and so there's a lot of work for each department involved and there is a, a national panel that assesses it. So to get to each the, the level, each level. Okay. So the present status is there's 38 of the UK universities involved. So most of the UK universities are actually involved in this um, initiative at various different levels. And just to, to reflect on where we are. So I've got a snapshot from 2012 and then a snapshot to now 2020. Um, so in 2012, there are only six champion departments. And but now there are very many more. You can see on the right hand side, there's many different. And you can see how for University of Manchester as a champion department. Uh, looking at the champion, junior practitioners, you can see there weren't so many in 2012, but you can see there's a lot more now in 2020 as people are progressing through, because as I said, it's a, a long-term process applying for these awards and doing good practice. And it's in reverting, there were, there were many different supporters in 2012, but you can see there's much fewer supporters now in 2022, as a lot of the universities in the um, UK try to uh, fulfill these criteria and work towards good practice. Okay, so I have actually put the or more details on these um, different uh, principles, but I probably won't go through all of these. So just put the, the for, so principle one is basically getting a good organization framework, um, making sure you've got good commitment and you've got time and money. And the whole idea is then you're going to uh, monitor the data for student and student admissions and performance, as well as staff um, at different levels. And then fair practices, that's encouraging, basically you're taking career breaks into account, gender awareness training for staff, um, and you want to encourage um, underrepresented groups to apply and make sure your shortlisting and appointments and application process are fair at all levels. And then the third principle is you want to have structures which enable career progression to be smooth and go well. So you need to make sure your department has a transparent and fair appraisal and appraisal development. Um, and BDR, so appraisals for uh, sorry, postgraduate students and academic staff and provide some mentoring and also they need to make sure there is some trans transparent uh, promotion processes 
So it's been clear as I've seen it over the last 10 years, a lot more departments have a uh, very clear, transparent matrices, sort of matrices for promotion for academic staff. So that's becoming clearer. Because as, um, as it's been highlighted, uh, many, a reason why once females are in the department, many females don't, or many minorities don't often perform so well because bad practice disadvantages minority people more than it does um, non-minority, mainly because they probably don't have such as a good support network to get informal mentoring and form, informal advice. So it's important that if there's sort of promotion and other criteria, there's a clear matrix that everyone is fair and transparent and everyone know what the criteria are and it can be applied equally. Another important part is the department culture. So I think that was brought up before in the previous talk by Hannah. It's important to have a, a, a good department or good working environment to work in, because there, especially now in COVID, there are different situations and different environments that have been brought up. Uh, and previously, when we were sort of face to face, there were different, it was good, you needed to have an inclusive culture so people feel happy to come to the department and, and feel safe and it's a good working environment and, and there's no sort of bullying or harassment. Uh, so it's in, important to create an inclusive, sorry, inclusive culture um, and make sure then department processes are inclusive um, and then also take account of caring responsibilities. So people, uh, we, we allocate, so have meetings scheduled sort of 10 till four. So in the olden days, people had to go into work and leave. We, um, they had the time to collect their, 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 student, their children after work. So think about, thinking about things of timing of meetings and things can make it easier uh, for certain staff or people with caring responsibilities. Um, it's so important to have inclusive social events that are inclusive because it's not worth having some people going to tea or some day having a private lunch and other people are excluded. So it's important to make social interactions inclusive and have opportunities for mutual support um, like that. Um, having positive role models, traditionally sort of younger females, undergraduates and school children may be put off if they don't see any female role models they can aspire to, there's no one looking like, like them. Uh, so it's important um, to use positive images in both internal and uh, external communications and also have encourage female uh, speakers and female chairs um, so students can see uh, females in the, the higher up leadership positions and then they may want to aspire to so they can see there's someone like them. Another very important um, point um, is a transparent work allocation model uh, and recognising the different contributions. There can be some bias in the way work is allocated to certain staff groups or staff members. Uh, some people take the leadership positions or others doing other work or certain admin roles are assigned to certain people. And um, this must be basically fair and transparently allocated. So some people should not be overburdened with teaching or overburdened with certain workloads so they haven't got time to do other, other things or things that may be valued more. So it's important um, there is a workload model and it is fair and it is transparent and open so people can discuss that and see what work is allocated and it can be fair. And then people should be, so people should be aware of having a, a workload model. As I said previously, it's important to have a flexible working because uh, some people, typically females, doesn't have to be take on more caring responsibilities at home. So in able to be coming sort of slightly late after trips or at least slightly early or work flexible hours is important and particularly more so within the COVID hour time, which is Hannah's been uh, talking about. Um, Tracy, I'm afraid you have five minutes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, great. So reflection for students and staff, what's happened. So the good news is, so I'm just reflecting between 2012 to 2017, the percentage of female students has increased from 21% to 24%. Uh, so that's good. So that's because the number of females has actually gone up, uh, gone up more than the number of male students. Um, so there's 38% more female um, undergraduate students now than there used to be. And female undergraduate graduate students achieve marginally higher degrees than their male counterparts. So if we just look at this top line here. Um, this is the degree profile, first, second, third. Uh, this is the all students. And males and females are pretty equal, but there's slightly higher more for females getting first. So basically it's pretty equal, but females get slightly more first and, first and two ones than their male counterparts. So there's no reason why females can't achieve when they do achieve when they do choose physics. The number of female undergraduates has increased. So this plot shows the percentage of students each subject for males and females for different subjects, physics, so uh, physics, astronomy, maths, and chemistry, for example. And here physics, you can see a slight increase over from 2012 to 17. So the percentage of females has risen slightly from 21 to 24%. Uh, and this is more, more than most other subjects um, over, the, over this year period. So there's 38% more female undergraduates, a 29% increase in female PhD students as well, but only the number of uh, female masters has fallen slightly, 
but this is over increased more by the undergraduates and PhD students, so that's good news. Again, this is the same plot, but just showing it on a nice plot, so showing the same number of undergraduates and postgraduate students increasing. Um, so it's, it's important to look at this across the pipeline to see if we are losing students. So if you look at this, this is horizontal sort of wise now. This shows the percentage of females undergraduate, postgraduates and PhD. And you can see that in 2017-18, there is actually very little drop from undergraduates to PhD students. So that's a good sign. So that means we're not losing undergraduates between um, PhD. So that's good. So in fact, we're slightly increasing. So we need to look at then the higher levels if we can maintain this, at least things are going to increase and not getting worse. So that's good, good news. Uh, I've got some data on uh, non-gender on uh, UK or non-EU. But then looking at gender, um, then to look at staff. So it's looking slight, not so good for staff. So for all academic staff, um, there's 82% males and 18% females over all uh, physics department. Postdoctoral research is about 21% females. So this is in line as we just saw with the undergraduates, the postgraduates are about 23 to 24%. So that's okay. So we are not losing anyone there. Where we are losing people is then in the pipeline, in the academic pipeline. So this, as I said at the very start, was about 5% way back in 2010. It's now risen to 11%, but we're still only about 11% professors, which if you compare to all subjects is still likely less. So it's 24 for all subjects and 11 for physics. So we're still uh, sort of losing out in the, in the high levels, the academic higher levels. Okay, so what can we do? Um, so, as I said, minorities are more disadvantaged by bad practice than the non-minorities, so I recommend universities sort of follow the um, Juno principles. Um, in universities can create support groups like women in physics groups, postgraduate research forum. It's a good idea if people in higher positions can support minority staff to attain positions of esteem and encourage them to apply for such positions. As I repeated, said before, it's ensure, important to ensure there is a fair and transparent workload. Um, and it's often sometimes females can be seen as a good citizens and given an admin overload or things that aren't actually going to help them from a promotion criteria or seen as leadership positions, even they take a lot of time and are very important jobs. So either you need to value those jobs or they need to be careful of how those are allocated or rotated. Um, you need to encourage females to stand for leadership positions and encourage potentially if, if research and grant um, attaining is invalid more than these other positions, we need to encourage females to do that or we need to value the other positions. So either way, it needs to be valued the work they're doing. We need to import, uh, ensure promotion criteria clear and transparent and advertise roles and visibility to ensure people have got someone they can look to that is like me and they can achieve that. And then so being aware, making that happen is being aware of unconscious bias in different process, recruitment and promotion example. So here's what we do. So Royal Holloway. Um, so we've got so we've actually done these pictures. Of, we make sure we do have um, student sort of diversity shown on our web page. Um, so we make sure we the students, female students, can see that there are females at different levels within the departments. These are some uh, pictures from our web page. Um, and we do have a women in physics support group. We have a research staff forum and a postgraduate staff forum. So here are some of our pictures from two that we've been running this with women in physics. Um, group from since 2009 so here's some pictures way back from 2012 and then some pictures of this year during covid we've gone to outside meetings and i've got our new logo so to summarize then uh, the numbers and percentage of female undergraduates have increased um, but still there's progress to be made in the number of female professors and so i do encourage i would encourage everyone to support and encourage uh, everyone in their department all levels uh, but particularly minority groups um, and, and females included in that um, who may feel more isolated, which is something that Hannah also touched on. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Tracy. Really interesting talk. Lots of um, good statistics there. Do we have questions? So I see a question from Marco. Go ahead. Hi, Tracy. Th thanks very much. Uh, you, you mentioned workloads uh, uh, quite a bit uh, and or, or work, workload model and monitoring. So let me ask in that direction. Um, one thing I've tried so far unsuccessfully to push for was uh, to give female members of staff a, a blanket extra 30 hours or something um, to acknowledge a fact that given that they are underrepresented, uh, but that we uh, have uh, a lot of things uh, like interview panels where we uh, have where we enforce gender representation and therefore they, they, they simply have a higher uh, load from 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 those sort of uh, activities um, that are 
uh, not monitored at, at a mm. sufficiently detailed level to 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 grasp it on a person by person uh, basis. So I, I I suggested that that we we just have a have a blanket number added mm. uh, for for those who 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 have uh, uh, to 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 um, sort of represent uh, uh, my, minorities as it uh, as it is at the moment. Um, is this something that is uh, uh, being done somewhere? Are, are you aware, no. or, or what, what? What are other uh, good ideas in that direction? Because I'm, I'm, I'm really hitting a so, wall. I mean, I think actually that's a very, very good idea, and something we could recommend. I mean, um, so I haven't actually heard it so explicitly done like that. I think that's excellent. I've heard at other universities they have um, it's called sort of community hours or something, something like that now, where they have good, good. Good citizen points. So, so there are uh, each workload is allocated so many points for good citizenship. So they don't have to pick up on minor things, as you said. So if people are asked to go to an interview panel. You don't have to allocate everything for individually. You just say you have so many hours of good citizenship when people are supposed to expect it to um, sort of contribute to the better working environment. But I think it would be idea, a good idea if, if sort of everybody had some sort of allocation, but potentially females or minority staff who are particularly probably doing more work like that do get more time allocated to this. Because um, as I know, as a female member, you know, you do get called to this. Not, an, and not only that I get asked to do things like interview panels and stuff, which you, you want to do, but also there's a lot of things I do sort of school talks or other talks that a lot of females tend to do potentially that uh, men you know, don't do because they're not that sort of profile. And so there is a lot of talks. I think that is a really good way to actually do it. And maybe, so it's not, I mean, the other point is you don't want to allocate things that push people out. So potentially one way is to give everyone an allocation of community spirit sort of thing, but give the females a larger amount. So then it's, the, the problem is with these situations, when you over or give, give extra things to females then people respond badly the other way. So if you kind of do things fairly, but give them more allocation, that's kind of an open way but I think that's a really good idea actually to allocate more open time to recognize there is a lot more work to do particularly you know if we're trying to address this we want the female the, the higher up females to do more to be this role model so I think it is important to be seen so I think that's an excellent way to do it <clears throat> okay so we're running a little tight on time but I see uh, Pippa's had her hand up for a while please go ahead I managed to unmute before someone said you're muted. Um, a closely related question. Do you have statistics on how much of the Juno work was falling on uh, women and minorities? Uh, you, I, you, were, you were driving the, the situation. The yeah, exactly. I've done a lot. So I did write, start a personal campaign to find out. <laughs> um, there, there are, I have seen, uh, we did a, there's a review of the IOP. So there are some statistics on that. So I don't have them ready to hand, but I can find them. But again, okay. yeah, me still a senior lecturer. That's right. <laughs> um, there is a lot of work that can fall on some people. Um, so you know, I think that is one thing that should be, be taken into account. But again, that comes part of the recognizing workload where the work's going and allocating and fairly giving people points for work that is done. Yep. Uh, there is some in that data, I'll find it for you, Pippa, and I'll get in touch. Thanks. Yeah, I'm interested in that as well. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Tracy, and sorry to those who, who weren't able to ask their question. I think we probably should move on. Um, so the next talk is from uh, Sasha Melhas. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Sasha, are you there? Yes, I am. Good, okay, we can see you, hear you, and see your slides, so you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Beautiful. The thing is about uh, right. sharing Atlas science. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so I'll have the pleasure uh, to talk about uh, how we are communicating what Atlas is doing um, and uh, how we, uh, at least in parts, adapted to the whole COVID situation, try to adjust our communication strategy there. Uh, so I'll talk about three sort of main areas which is our sort of uh, classics, you could say, and our main hub is the web page and then social media and uh, printables. So material that people can print and for example, use at home during the pandemics, that, that's at least the idea. Then I'll dive into our YouTube channel in general and uh, things we did there to sort of adjust to the situation that people uh, couldn't go and listen to the talks on site and then uh, say a few words about our uh, fantastic virtual visit program that obviously also is ideal for for this uh, situation anyway so as i said first uh, the uh, public web page just a few uh, uh, words uh, for those of you that don't know it's our central hub where we give sort of visibility to the collaboration uh, it's called the chief and the members and where we essentially 
combine, condense all of our in-depth material in various forms uh, and, and formats from press statements to simple news pieces. Briefings is a way to sort of make uh, our results, both physics, but also uh, sort of detector development and, and software uh, engineering more accessible to a broader audience by sort of boiling it down to a more simple level than uh, an actual scientific publication. Uh, there's features which are in-depth sort of articles on a specific subject that the atlas is working on so for example uh, dark matter uh, in general and then we sort of go a little bit deeper into um, what we can and want to do at the lhc slash an atlas uh, in, in that area and then uh, there's portraits to give visibility to sort of uh, outstanding members of of the collaboration and there's also blogs which is a little bit less uh, sort of formal and members of the collaboration Collaboration can essentially um, report on a on a specific top, topic like a, a conference or their work that they're doing uh, or a specific event uh, in the year. Uh, for those of you uh, that like statistics, there's also a few numbers at the bottom. I'm not going to go through in detail, um, but rather sort of skip to the next thing, which is social media, which is an area where we try to adapt a little bit to uh, the situation. Here on the right, you can see. Um, essentially all of the uh, uh, social media channels that, that we're active on. And you can see the uh, numbers that we're very proud of uh, showing that, that we have quite a community and we could also do quite uh, an increase in some of our uh, channels in the last year uh, by putting out sort of more uh, material and by putting in new work. And we also have some new channels that I'm gonna talk about uh, in a second now. Uh, by the way, all these images then all the, the icons are clickable if you look at the PDF yourself later, so you can uh, you have it easy to go there and follow us on all of these channels. Um, right, so for, for a few years, we've already sort of adapted a strategy of uh, creating dedicated content, which means content that is really tailored to each of these individual platforms, because sometimes um, uh, you require different formats, you require different length of video material, for example. So there's a, a lot of sort of tweaks uh, that you can do, uh, that you can at least try to make uh, your content perform better on the individual platform. It requires a little bit of work, um, but it has shown to sort of pay off. And we can see that by, for example, the increasing number of followers on platforms like uh, Instagram, <clears throat> where we started producing more uh, uh, sort of tailored uh, material for that platform, uh, which is also the second point in the list, for example, uh, in the past uh, or in the recent time, um, we developed sort of dedicated Instagram reels, so short little video clips uh, that always sort of have a fun or often have a fun touch to them. You see sort of a, an example with the Super Mario uh, in the top left of the pictures. Um, again, it's it's also a different target group, so sometimes also the, the content is tailored in that way, not just in terms of format, but also in terms of content to uh, try to uh, attract and get attention by, by uh, a different audience on the different platforms. Uh, we also uh, started and, and uh, continued throughout the last year our elevator pitches, which is short sort of uh, videos where members of the collaboration basically um, explain what we published in a recent briefing. So in one of these uh, written pieces on the web page, um, again, the videos are sort of cut in the right format and tailored in terms of length to the different platforms. And it's a nice way to get people's attention by having a video, by showing a face. Um, and then ideally, uh, and, and in some cases, we can also sort of drag people onto the web page to actually look at the piece. Uh, there's a few other things that we started, uh, Instagram quizzes, so to get uh, people engaged, not just to put information out there, but to also, um, I mean, sometimes just ask fun questions, uh, but that way they start sort of thinking on it and get a little bit more uh, um, attached uh, to us, hopefully. Uh, there's Twitter threads, which is also something that we started uh, in the recent time, um, which is essentially if trying to, um, on a platform that was originally designed for very short messages, trying to get across sort of a, a, um, a longer 
uh, or a compilation of, of uh, messages or of information. So that's, for example, one thing that we did when we reached the 1000 uh, collision papers in Atlas, uh, sort of go through a few examples, a few milestones in a, in a thread. Uh, and if people sort of look at one of the messages, they sort of automatically get the connection to the others. Um, and then, as I said, uh, we also started a new platform, which is TikTok, uh, started early last year, which again, <clears throat> sort of reaches a completely new audience, also requires, you can say, a different, uh, a different format uh, and a different style of content. Uh, we can, in part, reuse stuff that we that we sort of uh, made for Instagram, uh, but there's also dedicated material that was produced for this new channel. And uh, given that we've only been there for a few months, uh, the number of, uh, of followers is also increasing nicely there. <clears throat> Here's just a few examples, again, for those of you that, uh, that like uh, statistics of our top performing posts, and you can get a bit of a feeling of what what works well on, on which platform. I'm not going to dive in too much here, uh, but it is quite, for some of these things, it's actually quite a nice reach. So we have quite a number of people that see the post at least, um, and we can't necessarily go much deeper in, in terms of interpretation, but you get these numbers of impressions and engagements. It's like if someone likes it actually or shares it in one or another way. Um, and this is actually fairly nice numbers also compared with, with other institutions and so forth. Uh, then I'm going to dive into a, a different area, um, which is what we call printables. Um, whoops. And uh, there's some classics that we've had for a long time, which is the uh, brochure. And since we talked about languages and reaching people, uh, one thing that we're very happy of and we continuously working on is making all of these uh, all of this material available in different languages so our standard brochure giving sort of an overview of the collaboration physics and goals in a written piece as a handout we have in 16 languages by now and and we're working on more um, we have our coloring books actually we have a new one um, so we had the, the one about the Atlas experiment in general, and now um, we have one uh, that is called, you see it at the bottom in the middle, Particles of the Universe, that dives a little bit more into, uh, well, as it says, the particles, actually. Uh, so you learn a little bit about uh, elementary particles, which ones they are and what kind of properties they have. Uh, and again, um, it's uh, you have the chance to color a lot, but you also have the chance to learn something. Um, and to increase the letter even more, um, we developed uh, in the last year uh, activity sheets that you can do, for example, at home or even at school if, if your teacher uh, wants to, uh, to basically work with the information in the coloring book and even expand it. So there's some new concepts that are uh, uh, sort of added to the content in the coloring books on these activity sheets where you learn about decays, where you learn about things like uh, particles and antiparticles and so forth. So it's a, it's again fun exercises that still try to teach you something. That's at least the idea. And as uh, you'll always see that on the slides, the green links at the bottom is posters that have been presented uh, during the conferences on these individual uh, subjects. So they, they link you through there. All right, let me let me go on. Um, we put out some more uh, fact sheets again with the intention of making the information that we have in publications or on the web page more accessible, uh, which is the fact sheets, which is basically a remake of something that we had for a long time, but now we sort of spent quite some work in, in redoing them. And it's basically collecting facts about the physics and the experiment and the collaboration on sort of one sheet uh, uh, printouts um, on various topics. And you see some examples of that at the top. So as I said, from technology transfer to the, the collaboration composition and, and what it takes. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's meant to be a sort of a handout that we can use in, in public events or for people to just learn sort of some quick facts, hence the name uh, about Atlas and, and what we're doing. And then Sheet Sheets is going a slightly different uh, direction. Here we really try to sort of explain 
uh, basic concept, uh, concepts and terms that we use a lot in publications or in, in on the web page, uh, but not that everyone might be familiar with, right? So it's again an attempt or an idea to be more inclusive, to get more people to uh, enjoy and understand what we're writing about, because that content is also transferred to the web page. And then if we write up a briefing, for example, we can link to sort of these explanations. And again, it's a one page write up of, for example, something like Feynman diagrams that tries to explain in simple words and with simple illustrations um, to sort of uh, a less experienced audience what, what it is about, what is the advantages, what conservation laws are about, for example, things like that. And it's a, again, it's just the, uh, three examples. It's a growing number. And for all of these things, we're also trying to make them available in different languages. So both these sets um, we have right now in, in three languages already. And also there, the number is growing. And then another thing, again, to adapt to the situation uh, that we can't have outreach events, we try to put out some material for specific uh, occasions or holidays, if you want, um, to for people to get involved. Some things that they can do at home, and there's a few examples at the bottom right here. So we, for example, did uh, stencil templates for Halloween so that you can carve out your pumpkin with Atlas motivated uh, uh, images or we had Christmas tree decorations or uh, present uh, gift tags um, that, that we published. And there's a few more ideas coming out. So stay tuned for <laughs> holidays and seasonal activities this year as well. Um, again, it's a, the idea is it's a nice way to get people sort of uh, uh, interested uh, in, in what we're doing. Sasha, you have uh, three minutes left. Yes. Uh, then let me go to YouTube. Uh, just in general, um, in YouTube, we try to adapt to uh, the increased focus on long form videos. So we provided in the recent years and also continued that last year, um, provide longer videos that, for example, contain tours or summarize uh, um, sort of uh, specific uh, major activities like the installations that we had in the long shutdown. Um, <clears throat> to sort of adjust to uh, what YouTube likes and, and, and thereby also take advantage of being featured by YouTube, for example. So some of these videos were, were picked up and got quite the audience, um, again, because we, we tailored the content a little bit, which also includes things like oops, uh, adding dedicated thumbnails and, and presenting the videos in the right way. Um, and then you see um, some statistics again, for where the visitors are coming from, um, <clears throat> uh, for example, and you see uh, YouTube search, which means usually that uh, the videos were recommended to them. Um, so YouTube picked the videos up and recommended them to the to the viewers. And then um, you also see uh, the statistics on where we got our sort of uh, 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 watchers if you want people watching us uh, throughout the years and you see these nicely spikes there which bring me to another thing something that we tried adapting to the uh, pandemic situation is giving live talks on atlas related subjects um, on youtube since we couldn't i mean institutes couldn't do live talks on site we we thought it might be nice to sort of do atlas centric um, uh, live talks uh, about various subjects and you see some of the examples in the list in the playlist uh, on the right um, and on the button also written out uh, um, where we basically uh, found members and selected members of the collaboration that gave the talks from either the institute or even their home uh, on on these subjects and we also there try to cover subjects that are not sort of always uh, in the spotlight uh, so going from uh, things like how the detector works to um, computing, um, and then we'll have some more specific subjects in the near future, like machine learning uh, in LHC experiments and so forth. Um, right, yeah. So the, the idea in these is that uh, we have a presentation of about 30 to 40 minutes, and then there's always a Q&A session. So people can ask questions both on the YouTube platform itself, and we also collect 
uh, questions on Instagram in advance. Um, and then there's a sort of moderated Q&A session after the talk where, where we try to go through sort of the main questions that came up uh, through either of these, uh, these platforms. So again, it's a nice way to not just put material out there, but give people a chance to sort of interact with us and engage. And there's usually quite uh, a number of really good questions at the end. Um, and all these videos are still there uh, on the YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel. So you can also look at them uh, afterwards. And also there we have a poster on, on that. All right. And then last but not least, uh, final minutes, um, virtual visits. We have a very had, had a very successful uh, a year for our very nice, I think, uh, and very received virtual visit program. You see some statistics from where we had visitors basically connecting to what was mostly underground visits, actually. So the guide would go into the cabin and then welcome a group of, of students or a group of, of, of visitors via Zoom. Um, we had 150 underground visits in the last year. Uh, and it's again a nice way to interact with a person, with a member of the collaboration and get a little bit of a feeling, especially now in the uh, pandemic where no one can visit uh, Atlas for real um, from the public. Uh, but in general, this is something, this virtual visit program is something that we continue um, even when, when visits are possible, giving access, giving people a chance to visit the experiment that, that sits somewhere in the world, as you can see on the map, and don't have the chance to come to, uh, to Geneva. Um, yeah, you see a little bit of a breakdown of where these groups of people came from and which languages we, we gave these uh, visits in. Um, so it's a very impressive uh, uh, collection, I think, of, of uh, sort of uh, diverse groups from all around the, the globe. Um, Right, and then starting when the LHC is restarting again, we'll continue to do these virtual visits from the new visitor center uh, with the view of the control room, um, which is still in the very nice experience um, and, and, and what we can do in, in these times. And uh, yeah, one thing I just wanna mention, we also started so-called open virtual visits where you don't have to have a large group where you can basically sign up as, a, in, as an individual visitor to, uh, to enjoy one of these tours of the Atlas experiment or the Atlas um, control room. Yeah, so uh, given the time, I'll just leave you with that summary page and uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sasha. Really nice talk. Um, lots going on in Atlas. Do we have questions from anyone? Uh, while we're waiting, maybe I could start with a question. So at LHCB, we've also started to do virtual visits in the past um, maybe 18 months during the pandemic, but I find it's quite a labor intensive process. Um, maybe that's because our setup was more designed to train people to actually go underground. So I'm wondering for 150 visits in a year, what kind of training and coordination is involved? Is there a big team of people coordinating this? um there's actually not a big team there's a very effective very small team coordinating it uh there is unfortunately one could say also uh, most of these visits are carried by very few people um so there is a a core number of of guides you could say which is like a handful of people uh that take up most of the responsibility and and do get, I mean, thank you very much to those people at this point um, for making these tours possible. So we try to train guides, uh, more and more guides, um, but it's it's really difficult. Um, so it's carried by by a, a very few people, um, and it's also organized by um, essentially one uh, <laughs> person to some extent. Um, so it, it is it is quite the work, but it, we think it's it, it really pays off. It's a really nice experience. And, and also the people that do the tours really enjoy it. And, and uh, we get really very nice feedback for these tours, as, as you probably know as well. Indeed, yeah. Thanks a lot, Sasha. Um, I see Tracy had a hand up next. Hi, thanks very much. Um, um, yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I've all used the tours for my uh, student class and I think they're really good. The, the views of Atlas are really good and informative and really fun. Um, just asking actually for the, the colouring books and things. 
Um, so I'd like to download them for my nieces and families and, <laughs> and things. Do we just download and print them ourselves? And also, have you thought about, because a lot of people are busy and don't actually have time to sort of print them out, handing them out or somehow printing them out at the Atlas UK meetings and things like that when we're in person or the things when there's, you know, parents would pick something up but haven't got time to print them out. I mean, obviously you want to save paper as well. So that could be something in the future. Um, have you thought about that or how they are so available? I mean, there, there's, there, I mean, everything is possible and everything was done is, is the quick answer. Um, so, I mean, yes, the simplest version is obviously they're, they're on the site on the web page for download and you can just print them. We have also uh, printed out versions, uh, usually at, this, at CERN, for example. Um, they are used at or have been used, not so much last year, at public events where people bring them and actually turn them into an activity. And we've had them, for example, at Atlas Collaboration Weeks. Um, so we, we obviously encourage members of the collaboration to use them at their local events. Um, and it has been done several times, at least for the first coloring book. Uh, the second one came out during the pandemic, so there wasn't too many public events. Um, but yeah, it, it also that has been done to make it more easily that, that visitors can just pick one and don't have to go to the web page. Uh, and and printed themselves. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, I think we have time for one last question, um, Claire. Yes, it's it's half a question and half a comment. Um, it's about the the role of subtitles, automatic subtitles, to uh, for multilingual support, because most of our material is of course in English, uh, and even if some of our audience can manage. I was really worried um, by you know, the negative impact it would have for when I, I try to speak to my French or any other language. So uh, I have the feeling, and I, I'm curious if you have any measurement or the same feeling. I have the feeling that thanks to the pandemic, uh, people got more and more used to watch videos online. And I am told by some students that uh, I can assume that they will automatically know how to start the subtitles and switch to their own language. In which case, I shouldn't be shy anymore to put any English uh, video on my French speaking website or something. Is it just because I picked a couple of students who are more advanced than the others, or did you have feedback about that? Um, because it's really important for our messages. I mean, we get we get regular sort of questions about uh, um, subtitles or closed captions, and for example, for the YouTube videos that you that I talked about we we I mean obviously all the talks that we had so far though there is other ideas have been in English um, but we try to both provide live captioning sort of during the talk um, and we also uh, worked on and, and have for essentially all of the talks already uh, captioning um, on the on the YouTube obviously that is only in in English the problem is with the automatic captioning it yeah what you get is usually not great um if you if you even go to other languages so if you add the translation factor in it's, it's probably going to be even worse um so we actually worked with companies trying to get the closed captions for the uh, for the videos that we have on youtube um but also the results there weren't too great so here we actually really hope that cern as a whole will will sort of put some work into both the live captioning and the uh, and and sort of uh, the offline captioning if we want to call it that um, but yeah we've, we've started that at least for the language that the talk is in uh, for all of our content and if we put out these small videos for example on social media we always add the the closed captions ourselves um, um, in in a way that the platform allows for it um, yeah, but it but it is an issue, um, and it it's been brought up uh, by by sort of viewers or by by, by people uh, several times. But it's not straightforward to get these in a nice way. Uh, these uh, captions. Okay, I think we're going to have to bring things to a close there. Um, thanks, Sasha, for those who asked questions. Uh, all right, so our next talk is from Janina Nicolini, who's going to talk to us about. Um, outreach activities at LHCB. So hi, Janina, I can see you. I can see your slides. Hopefully we can hear you as well. I hope so too. Yeah, okay. very good. So go ahead and if you're ready. Okay, perfect. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the outreach at the OCB experiment today, and I want to give a broad overview of what we are doing in terms of outreach and then go into uh, some more details for some selected topics. So first of all, just a reminder, the LUCB experiment is one of the four largest AC experiments based at the LUC point eight. And we focus there on B and C physics and precisely we perform precise measurement of CKM, matrix elements, CP violation, rare decays and so on. And currently we have a major upgrade of our experiment going on in the long shutdown of the LHC. And we're getting ready for the restart of the LHC for run three this March. So let's tackle the topic outreach. So we are still living in a pandemic. So what we all have been asking ourselves um, the last two years is how can we actually provide valuable outreach content even though it needs to be fully online. And for LECB, we now have a new LECB website where we actually publish our, a selection of our articles with more detailed explanation. And last year we published 12 of these articles. And the first one this year came already out talking about a measurement that has been presented here at the left hand photon conference as well. In addition, we published our new results also in newspapers and online media to reach more people of the general public. And this is an important step that I'll come back later. There are also new materials, like for example, the 50 plus hadron website, where all the hadrons are presented that have been discovered at the LHC so far. And we are now able to provide online versions of, for example, our master classes, which are our main tool to reach high school students. And then obviously a big topic is that we have uh, social media and we are active there on different platforms. We provide now videos where we give, for example, explanation to measurements we have been performed, but also videos where we show some of our sub detectors in more details and with more explanations. We established virtual visits um, in the last year um, to, to get that as an important outreach content also for the future. And we started to actually um, provide our new exhibition for future in-person visits. So let's dive into the topic of social media. ACB uses social media networks to publish news, performed upgrades and physics results. And we're actually present on, on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter as like most of our experiments uh, at ACR. And our follower numbers are between 5.7 and 28.7 thousand people. So we can actually reach quite a bit of audience. So let's look what we actually learned so far. So our most successful posts have been about physics results. So for example, here, um, test of leptin urine visibility measurements or the discovery of tetraquarks. And what we learned is then if our posts actually include pictures and plots, we can actually attract more attention. So this is really important to, to have here, as Sasha already mentioned in, in his talk as well, that we try to adapt the, the content to the platform we are using. And what we learned is that Twitter is, attract, is especially important if we want to attract attention from science journalists. They seem to use Twitter for that mostly. And then Instagram is a nice platform to get more engagement with the general public. When we look into newspaper, LECB has actually a long tradition of, of getting in contact with newspapers to, to publish the results to the general public. And what is important there is to have a close coordination between the newspapers um, to prepare articles in time for our scientific publication. And as you can see on the left side, we actually have publication in newspapers all over the world. So this is something we're proud of and we want to continue in the future. But we also now make a more heavier use of new online media. And the benefit here is that the stories are actually written by academics and researchers, and therefore we can actually provide a high valuable content. And I picked here the example of the conversation because the conversation is a platform that actually has additions in several regions and therefore also seven, several languages. And we can actually create there about 100,000 reads per LHCB story. And the cited article here was on the front page that day and gathered about 200,000 reads worldwide. So you can reach much more audience there as well just by instead of just only using traditional newspapers. And what is also nice, they also have other formats, like for example, podcast episodes. And the last one released was an LHCB topic, I heard there about 34,000 listens, which is quite a high number. 
So now let's move forward to the master classes. We have many institutes that participate in the LACB master classes. And last year in February, March, we performed them the first time online. And um, we not only moved our international, but also the national master classes fully online. And we used their Zoom webinars to, to have an interactive um, experience for our students and, and to have more exchange with them. We also tried to use platforms like Kahoot to have interactive quizzes and, and make it a bit more lively. We have now a new interface for our exercises, which are D0 lifetime measurement and event just by analyze. So it looks much more modern nowadays. Our students usually do the exercises in small groups and then they, we do a combination of all the results together with them to discuss them, to give them a bit more understanding on the physics. And then we have in the end for our international masterclass a short virtual visit of LHCB to, to keep going on the excitement that we hopefully created there. So we obviously also have to tackle challenges that don't occur if we do in-person masterclasses. And that is, for example, that we have now groups of students and individual students from different high schools coming in one session. So we don't have the, the um, benefit of students having the same level of knowledge, but we need to adapt to different levels. So this is quite a challenge, but we try to tackle that as good as possible. And the second one is that our moderators are not sitting together anymore, but need to use external platforms, like for example, Metamos to communicate. But what we have seen is that in 2021, the attendance was actually back to about 50% of what we had in 2019 with our last in-person masterclasses. And what is really nice to see is that we are starting to reach students from more remote locations that are usually not able to travel to the universities. And in addition to that, we actually have currently several institutes working on new exercises, for example, on multivariant analysis tools um, to, to not only broaden the, the type of exercises we can provide, but actually to have more broader applications. For example, we can provide them to high school students and want to come as interns to the universities if they try to look into studying physics or as part as university lab work training for our university students to give them more insight of what we are actually working on as a collaboration, as an experiment. So now let's move forward to the virtual tours. The virtual tours have for us several benefits. For example, we can show our full detector in its context, meaning physics and also geographically wise. And we can reach much larger groups, especially of the general public, if we try to um, advertise these virtual visit broadly. And what is also a benefit as for the online master classes as well is that we can reach people from more remote areas that are usually not able to travel to CERN. And since we are now in this long shutdown, we can actually access details of our detector that are normally inaccessible in person, even if we can take visitor groups into the cavern. And in addition, we can offer virtual tours, provide videos and so on. So far we had five official tours where we had between 250 to 400 attendees. So it's a much smaller number than compared to uh, the amount of tourist atlas is done, but uh, I think our pop, uh, our audience are usually much bigger groups. Um, so in addition, we also offered one VIP tour to the delegates of Costa Rica. We had a CERN alumni event where we contributed. There is a French video tour where students from the EPFL University um, made a tour of the detector and showed some sub detectors in more details and we had several tours of institutes where they showed the detector to their students. Usually our virtual tours are about a one hour zoom that we know where we have one host who gives an introduction to the um, to our visit and then we have two underground guides plus technical helpers and sometimes also surface guides. So let's go into the details of what we actually have in our virtual tours usually. We have six steps. We start with an introduction to the visits, guides, and Zoom features to ensure everyone can follow the tour as good as possible. And then we introduce the physics that are studied at OECB and give an overview about the detector. And for us, it's really important to adapt this introduction talk as close as possible to the knowledge of our, our audience. So you see here, for example, um, 
some detailed pictures of our vertex locator sensors if we have more experienced people that already have a background in physics or in an example for how our tracking system works if we have people from the general public where we try to make analogans to everyday life to make it easier for them to understand what we're actually doing. Then we go over, give a geographical context of a C where we show a short video and we show the LEC 0.8 surface to give the people a bit of an understanding where they actually are. And then we dive into our underground visit where we start on our visitor platform to give an optimal overview about our detector, as you can see on the top right picture. And then one of our guides goes inside of our detector and actually shows the different subdetectors. Like here, for example, um, the preparation for the plume detector or the newly installed beam pine in the magnet. And once we're done with the underground part of our visit, we move over to the assembly hall where our other guide is there to show, for example, the sci-fi C-frame modules or other physicists and collaboration members working in our clean room to assemble the upstream detector. And then we usually end our visit with a Q&A session. And we always try to answer selected questions live to, to have a more active exchange with the people attending our visit. But what we learned is that it's really helpful to, to have two helpers answering questions in the Zoom Q&A to satisfy everyone and to, to actually be able to answer much more questions and don't leave a lot of them unanswered. And in addition, we provide a Google document for more questions. This is an experience which we had after the uh, Seren Summer student visit where so many questions were asked that it was impossible to answer them live and in the Q&A um, just by it is. So let's come to the feedback what we got. Here you can see two really ratings from two really different visits from certain newcomers and then from the general public. And they mostly are really, really positive. And we think that is this this is indeed the fact because we have really diverse teams doing our virtual tours in terms of gender, nationality, and expertise. So we not only have our spokesperson helping out, but we have master's students, PhDs, postdocs, and permanent staff people that help us to do these tours. So we have a really broad uh, knowledge coming together and, and different viewpoint, and this makes our virtual tours really special. So we also got some feedback in ways to improve, and I think the most important lesson we took is that we got for the same visit, the comment that we should more, show more or less detail. So it's definitely impossible to satisfy everyone while this is obviously still our goal. And then we got the question on how people can actually get involved with LHCB and to spend more time on the Q&A. And this is the main reason why we have this Google document now. There we link different opportunities, how people can get involved at CERN and LHCB, for example, through the CERN Summer Student Program and to give the opportunity to, as I said before, to, to ask more questions and get answers to them. There was also the request to have more languages and this is something we're currently tackling. There are tours in preparation in English, French, German, and Italian. So we try to be more diverse and not only offer English tours. And let me come to the last topic for today, which is our new exhibition for future in-person visits. In 2020, we had a redevelopment of the LXCB exhibition at point eight and it's done in four zones leading to our underground visit and as unfortunate as the pandemic is it allows us now to perform the upgrade of this exhibition without any implication for our visitors and it is fully mostly founded by CERN so let me start our zone one is where we have the entrance to our visitors and we start with an introduction to the LACB control room and then we move over to zone two, where we have a multimedia experience, which I will show in more detail in a second. And from there, we can go to zone three, where we have the possibility to display, to display these detector cross and prototypes to give people um, a more detailed understanding of, of our sub detectors and how the LECB experiment can actually work. And then leading towards those cavern access, um, we have zone four where we have a model of the cavern to discuss safety um, features with, with our visitors, but also to show them the concept of our cavern. And we have display panels 
and our helmets uh, aligned there for the visitors to start the visit. So we actually were able to finish our new multimedia room at the end of last year. So really a first milestone was hit there for our new exhibition. And the goal is to provide an immersive and interactive experience in the future when we can welcome back our in-person visitors. And here you can see a picture of the finished room and I'm gonna show it in a bit more details now. So first of, oops. So first of all, we have three main elements. We have flat detector model, which shows the outline of our detector and the different sub detectors, including our magnet. And then aligned with the different sub detectors, we actually have panels on the side that show the sub detectors in a bit more detail in terms of their structures. And you can find explanations there. And then last but not least, we have animations that are done with beamers and displays on the side. And here you can see in a picture of the example where we have two proton beams colliding in our vertex locator. So we give a bit more um, understanding of the concept, how our detector works and what is actually going on when we take data. So let me conclude now. The pandemic kept making outreach really challenging, but the last year was successful for LHCB. We not only developed new tools, like videos, online media, but we also were able to successfully move all tools online, like our master classes and the detector wizard. We hit first milestone for new for the new in-person exhibition, and we were able to to not only um, move our detector tours online to the virtual tours, but we want to use them in the future to still be able to reach the overall new audience that we haven't reached before because of geographical, uh, the geographical situation or maybe social backgrounds that make it challenging to come to CERN and visit us there. Um, so thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Thanks a lot, Janina. Um, indeed, we're open for questions from anyone. I don't feel I can really ask questions myself since I've been <laughs> involved in most of these things. I don't really have a question, but I just want to say that I recently visited the LHCB uh, cavern, which was wonderful, and went through the new bit of the exhibition. It looks really good so far. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it turns out. Thanks. That's great to hear, Clara. I think one of one of the nice things about the visits um, of LHCB in general is that we can really take people inside the detector, and I guess that's that's probably something which is much harder to do on Atlas and CMS. Um, uh, I see a question from uh, Stephen. Go ahead. Hello there. That was a very nice presentation, Janina. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, if any of this material, this new material in the visiting center. Um, is it going to be available on the web pages as well? In other words, will there be some of the, the experiences that you can have in person available there? Are there any plans for changes to the, to the website? So um, I would say one of the big challenge or changes we are still planning to do for our new website is not only the redesign, but to um, improve our descriptions of the different sub detectors, for example, and this would be a nice place where we could place pictures of, for example, the exhibitions um, or parts of the exhibitions, like different prototypes we have there to, to take pictures and upload to them to also give details explanations. And then we have now a gallery where we want to show pictures of, for example, um, our performed upgrades for different sub detectors, since we are exchanging quite a lot of our um, detector right now in this long shutdown. I hope this answers your question. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised and, and I think in the interest of time we should move on. So thank you again, Janina. Welcome. So our last talk of the session is from Simone Donati. Yeah, yeah. Can you so, see me? Can yeah, you see we slides? can see and hear you and I see your slides. Um, although I do also see your thumbnail pane. So I don't know if you want to go full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just waiting to make sure that uh, everything was fine. Is that better? 
please, yeah, go ahead whenever you're ready. So hello everybody, I am Simone Donati from the University of Pisa and uh, my talk is uh, on a slightly different topic. In fact, uh, I will talk uh, on the initiatives that the Italian research groups working on Fermi Lab experiments have taken to involve the new generations of students in the, in the lab's endeavors. So this is my outline. First, I will say a couple of words about Fermilab and about the history of the collaboration between Italy and Fermilab, which will help to understand the organization of our programs. I will then describe the most important initiative that uh, we have taken to involve the new generations in the lab endeavors, that is the summer students program. I will go through the students uh, recruitment process, uh, the selection of the supervisors and training programs at Fermilab, the involved costs and the sponsorships. Uh, I will also show some statistics relative to the almost 40 years of the program's existence, except for the last couple of years, of course, uh, but uh, too bad we had to cancel the program in 2020 and 2021. But uh, to keep the connection with the students alive, alive, we organized last summer a three-day workshop at the Frascati INFM National Laboratories to show the, to the students the initiatives of the lab. I will also talk about the internship at the Space Science Laboratories and Universities in the United States that we have been organized in the last few years on behalf of the Italian Space Agency by taking the Fermilab program as a model, as a model. Then my conclusions will follow. Well, of course, there is no need to say that Fermilab is the most important particle physics laboratory in the United States. And uh, Fermilab is now exploring the high intensity frontier with the neutrino program and the muon campus experiments, uh, mu 2 and G-2. The lab is also at the frontier of uh, accelerator science, detector, and computing technologies. Uh, Fermilab is structured in a number of divisions. These include the particle physics and the neutrino divisions, which develop uh, the lab's experiments, the accelerator division, which develops the new accelerator technologies and provides beams to the lab's experiments, the technical division, which provides the necessary, uh, necessary technological support to the experiments, and the scientific computing division, which develops the infrastructures for data handling and analysis. Fermilab has about uh, 1,800 employees and uh, thousands of visitors from the entire world. The lab's atmosphere is very vital, eh? And this is the ideal environment to involve new students and young researchers in particle physics. So the collaboration between, and, uh, between Italy and Fermilab was started uh, in the early 80s. And uh, for many years, it was mostly dedicated to the CDF experiment at the Tecpatron. I remember the moment of maximum Italian participation in CDF was probably in the first decade of this century, when a total of about 100 Italian scientists, scientists from many INFN departments and uh, Italian universities were involved in CDF front two. That was actually a large fraction of the entire CDF collaboration, which at that time counted a total of about 600 researchers. No need to say that our students were the cornerstone of this uh, fruitful collaboration between Italy and Fermilab. And I remember we had about uh, something like uh, 100 master thesis and uh, 35 PhD thesis. That may sound uh, small numbers if compared to LHC numbers, but please keep in mind that uh, that was uh, um, in an experiment in the United States, not in Europe. So the collaboration was uh, uh, a little more complex with respect to collaborating with CERN, especially for the young generations. Many of these students were recruited with the most important of, of our uh, initiatives for them. That is the summer students program, which was uh, a moment of inspiration for, for them. Uh, these students were uh, at the beginning 
master students, so students who had never got out of the university. And this was their first experience in an international laboratory. Okay, so today, today Italy is again deeply involved in the new labs endeavors. Uh, the Muon campus experiments, G-2, which is taking data and publishing results, and mu -E. And the, the current neutrino experiments, and uh, Icarus, for example, and uh, the future Dune. Now, a total of about 140 Italian scientists, engineers, and technical staff from several INFN departments and universities are involved in the labs uh, experiment. So let's uh, come to the, to the point of our talk, uh, and let's talk about the summer students program. Although we receive uh, most applications from students enrolled at Italian universities, a fraction of the applications are from students of European universities. Of course, we take all the applications with the same level of consideration. The program is open to master students in several disciplines, physics, applied physics, engineering, material science, and computer science. Student selection is highly competitive, of course, and is based on the CV, on recommendation letters, and an interview that makes sure that the students have the right interests, the right personal motivations and the technical skills and sufficient proficiency in English. The students spend nine weeks at Fermilab, usually August and September. Uh, physics students are typically involved in the analysis of experimental data, design and setup of particle detectors, design and test of part particle accelerator components. Engineering students are usually involved in the design of detector and accelerator components, test of superconducting materials and magnets, design of precision mechanics components, uh, analog and digital electronics components, advanced computing infrastructures for data storage and analysis. Since 2015, the University of Pisa has acknowledged six ECTS credits for this uh, internship. So this is a little technical. Uh, this ECTS system is the European Credit Transfer and Accumulating System. In practice, the credits are the currency that is acknowledged to the students for the courses they attend at university. For example, in Italy, a standard one semester course corresponds on average to six or nine credits. And the total number of credits for one academic year is 60. So you can see that the six ECTS for this internship is 10% of what the students typically has to take in one year. So it's an important acknowledgement from the university for, for something that is taken outside the university. Okay, just as an example, these plots show some statistics of the training programs of the last two years of the program existence, that is 2018 and 19. In 2018, we had 10 physics students and 15 engineering students, mostly involved in the development of Fermilab experiment and also contributing to the accelerator, scientific, computing, and technical division uh, um, initiatives. 2019, we had similar numbers, and of course, we have the numbers for 2020, 2021. Uh, there is one in the histograms relative to space science laboratory for free students. We will talk uh, about it in one of the following slides. So some of us probably are wondering who sponsors the program. Uh, the cost to the students, for the students, is of course zero dollars. But the cost of one student for nine weeks at Fermilab is not negligible. It's about $9,000. This is the list of the sponsors in decreasing, decreasing order of provided financial support. The US Department of Energy, the Italian National Institute of Nuclear Physics, the Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, the Italian Space Agency for the internship at the Space Science Laboratories, and the University of Pisa. Let's see what Fermilab provides and what does not provide to the students. 
Uh, FemLab provides a weekly salary of about $400, free housing in the dorm, and a shared rental car for local transportations. The students have to buy their own round trip ticket from Italy to Chicago, and the DLF insurance, which is mandatory to, mandatory to get the J1B visa. Uh, Fermilab acts as a sponsor for the J1 visa, and the employment office provides all the necessary, necessary assistance of, and for the involved bureaucracy. Let's see now the important dates of the program for the organization of the program. So between January and March, we received the students' applications. At the same time, we received the training programs from the candidate supervisors, which we have to select. We completed the students' selection and we assigned them to the supervisor typically in May. And the students fly to Fermilab on the last weekend of July. And on the next Monday, they are hired as Fermilab interns for nine weeks. They take their trainings and orientation courses. And after four weeks, we make a mid-term review. All the students report on the progress of their work with a 20 slide presentation. And in the last week at Fermilab, we make the final review. The students show their achievements in a 20 slide presentation and write a 20 page report for our archives. In October, Committee of the University of Pisa reviews the students' work and acknowledges six ECTS to the successful uh, students. Well, to me, the statistics of the past 35 years, almost 40 years, is impressive. Since 1994, we had approximately 550 students that participated in the program. The plot shows the number of students per year. We started, I mean, not myself. In 1984, I was still in high school. Uh, but the program started with three students that year, while we had 28 students in 2019. In the first few weeks, few years, we mostly accepted the physics students to work on CDF within the Italian groups. And it, take, it took a few years to have our physics students known also in the other experiments and the, the engineering students known in the technical accelerator and computing division. Most Italian universities have in, been involved, but Pisa, Rome, and Padova have dominated the scene. This is due to the long-standing participation of these cities and INF and departments in CDF. Pisa actually today is also deeply involved in mu to, in mu G, in mu to e and G-2, and uh, this, is keep, this still keeps Pisa numbers high. Um, we also had a bunch of students from non italian universities, as I said, for example, Munich, Heidelberg, Wazel, and some more. We only kept a detailed record of the training programs for the last 12 or 13 years. This is the distribution among the several Fermilab divisions of the students for the last 12 years. This corresponds actually to 270 students, that is approximately 50% of the total. And after all, there is an approximate balance between particle physics division and the other divisions. Uh, with the financial support of the Italian Space Agency, the Italian National Institute of Astrophysics and the Italian National Institute of Nuclear Physics, about 30 students, 30 summer students, if I count also last year, have had the opportunity of uh, having an internship in laboratories and universities involved in space science in the US. We have basically reproduced the model of the summer students program at Fermilab. And in this case, uh, the selected students actually choose their destination and research groups on their own. And we take care of them uh, in all the logistics on the American soil and verify the progresses of their training program. As I said, we had to cancel the programs uh, in 2020 and 2021, but to keep the connection between the students and Fermilab alive, last summer we organized a three-day workshop at the INFN Laboratories in Frascati, that is a national laboratory. The 20 selected students attended the seminars on Fermilab experiments and visited the Frascati's lab's infrastructures. 
uh, we had interesting talks from several uh, researchers, including uh, the directors of the Frascati National Laboratory of NFN, the Grand Sasso Laboratories, and um, with an overview of the lab's initiatives and future, and future prospects. We also had the talk from Fermilab director Nigel Locker, and uh, the main topics of the first few day, two days were the Fermilab Neutrino program and the new on campus experiments. My personal impression was that the students enjoyed the talks. Um, they also enjoyed the more the visits, uh, for example, to the Frascati's infrastructures, for example, Daphne and the um, Chloe, and so on. Uh, what to say is uh, a nine week internship at Fermilab would have been much better, but it was not, of course, possible. Uh, we did our best to keep the connection between uh, Fermilab endeavors and the students' life. And I think that a couple of, of those students that were selected for that workshop are now doing their master thesis with uh, some of the groups, uh, research groups uh, working at Fermilab. So it was actually a good uh, um, also opportunity to involve them more directly. So let's, uh, let's jump to the conclusions. The Italian Summer Students Program at Fermilab is a multidisciplinary nine-week internship for physics and also engineering students. We had a lot of engineers. Eh? And uh, an hands-on training on Fermilab high-tech research. We have had about 550 students since 1994. Many of them, many of them ex ex extended their collaboration with Fermilab with a master thesis and then for their PhD and started their careers at Fermilab. Of course, we hope to, to be able to uh, a program again next summer and for the many years to come. Uh, thank you, and done. Thank you very much, Simone. <clears throat> I certainly know several of my Italian colleagues who started out through this program, so it's obviously had an impact. Um, okay, we're open for questions. I see uh, one from Stephen. Hi, Simone. Uh, it's another very nice talk. I think I think I've seen you do this <laughs> before. It's it's really uh, appreciated. I like the program a lot. Um, I should say, you know, it's it reminds me a lot of the program that we do from the US coming over to CERN. We have the, the RU summer student program, but also a semester program, which is perhaps more similar because we have to find mentors and attach them and, and go through this whole uh, effort ourselves. I think it's, it's they're really, really positive for the students. I, I continue to get contacted by students 10 years after <laughs> I'm, I'm, and, and try to keep track of them. I'm curious, do you have a method to keep track of, of students who've been through the program and to look at their successes and what areas they go into in their, in their future careers? So uh, in the end, you asked the two questions. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have already seen me giving the talk. The answer is yes. Since uh, we are living in uncertain times uh, uh, and this program has not been executed uh, for the last two years, I am concerned that uh, people will forget about it. No? And who knows what will happen in the future, independently of the sanitary emergency. So I'm trying to defend it, to defend its, its existence by talking about it to everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I'm doing the same thing. So. <laughs> because, uh, you know, this is based mostly on tradition. No? The, now Fermilab has not seen uh, European people for two years almost. Or, uh, has not seen our students for two years. Uh, things change, so I'm afraid of possible changes. <laughs> but I'm uh, optimistic that uh, we will uh, keep it alive for long. Uh, unfortunately, the, the answer to the second question is no. We do not have a, a method to keep uh, the links uh, with the students alive. It's only on personal basis. Uh, for example, uh, just uh, two or three days ago, a former summer student uh, came to see me to say he was a, a student not from Pisa, but from another university, an engineer who, who then did his PhD 
at uh, the Sant'Anna School here in Pisa and was in Pisa for the last three years. Now he, he got a postdoc uh, at, uh, in San Diego and he came to say goodbye <laughs> and to thank me again for that opportunity uh, five years ago. We suffered for, it's bad, but uh, we do not have the, the strength to uh, build the mechanism to keep the contact with these guys. Uh, they, they usually call us back uh, during the, their career. I can maybe make a, a comment there if, if, I, if there's time. Uh, I, I took advantage of the CERN alumni um, network. So in my case, the students were coming over to CERN uh, to register them and to make a group. And so I, I have them sign up to be in this group. And it, it's not that there's activity on it, uh, but well, I can yeah, understand. Uh, the alumni is a typical Anglo-Saxon tradition. It's not very strong in Italy. No, there is not this tradition. So too bad the answer is no, but some of them are still, I mean, a large fraction of them works in, in high energy physics, maybe in, in different experiments, not in Fermilab experiments, but you, Many times you see them, at, I meet them at conferences in person, when they are in person. Yeah. Okay, th thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, uh, Simone. I think in the interest of time, we should uh, close the session so people can go and grab a, a coffee or a comfort break before the next parallel talks. So thanks to all our speakers again. I think this is a really interesting session. Um, we will have, uh, you should know, a panel discussion starting at um, four o'clock local time uh, on equality, diversity and inclusion. So many of the things we discussed in this session should be covered there as well. Thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, bye.